Welcome to another episode of the Damage Report, everybody. I'm John Adarola. We've got a big show for you that is sort of our mandate, and we are going to do the best that we can. Not only are we going to talk in great detail about the actual situation at the border that the president will be attempting to deceive you about a little bit later on in his primetime address later tonight, we're going to be talking about taxes. Both a look at Fox News's messaging around higher marginal tax rates on the wealthiest individuals. What is their strategy in fighting back against that? But also we'll be talking about AOC's recent comments about higher possible tax rates with our first guest a little bit later on the show. That is David Sirota, who's been on the show before, probably very familiar with his work. We're gonna be talking about taxes. We're gonna be talking about the uh, the coverage already of potential 2020 presidential candidates and more a little bit later on. Uh, later on in the show, actually, we're gonna be joined by uh, Matthew uh, Chenahan, uh, who's gonna be talking to us about his new show, Valley of the Boom, about the rise of massive internet corporations and the internal drama and politics that to some extent shaped the early internet while I was growing up actually. So that's gonna be very exciting and we'll be closing out the show, assuming we have time as always, with Meanwhile In, a brief look at news from around the world. And very interestingly, one of those topics is, do you remember in Cuba the sonic weapon attacks news that was going around? Uh, they've discovered what it actually was. Wait until you find out what that what that actually was about. Turns out, not so much a weapon necessarily. Uh, but first, the big story of the day. Tonight, Donald Trump is going to go before the nation and talk about the crisis at the border. The problem with that is there's not a crisis at the border. There are a few crises at the border, but they're actually of his own making. So when he chooses to tear gas or pepper spray, pepper spray migrants, when he chooses to separate families or cage children, when they treat migrants so callously that multiple children die in border patrol custody, I would call those crises, I would call those humanitarian issues. That's not what he's talking about though. He is going to make the case that things are so bad at the border, the immigration situation is so dire that he needs to have his massive wall. Whether it's the concrete wall that he was promising for years or the steel wall that he's talking about now, God only knows, maybe it's plastic, I don't know. But that's what he's going to be pushing for and the issue with that is that the facts just aren't there. And so we're gonna break down the actual situation at the border, the actual situation having to do with immigration into this country, especially undocumented immigration. Is there any case to be made that we face a national emergency? Because there's a very real chance that Donald Trump will declare one a little bit later on today. So. I'm gonna to attempt to be as fair as possible to him. So let's talk about a couple of different ways that there could be a national emergency at the border. So if lots and lots of people, historic levels of people were coming across the border, then maybe you could make the case that that's a national emergency. Certainly that would be big, I would be surprised because the headlines haven't been there about it. But maybe the media is dropping the ball and lots of people are coming across the border in ways that they didn't used to. It turns out though that that's not actually the case. So if we bring up this chart, you're gonna see Data from 2006 up to 2016 showing net illegal immigration from Mexico and Central America. Exactly the sort of undocumented immigration that Donald Trump loves to talk about. And you see there that for going back about a decade now, there was either negative net illegal immigration or there was equal. And so some people are coming across the border into America, some people are going back from America across the border. That's the sort of process though, although we don't talk about it this way, is happening at many border crossings literally every day. There are tons of people who go across for the day, then go back. Sometimes it takes a few weeks, sometimes a few months. That sort of thing certainly happens. But we're not facing any sort of massive historic level of people just walking across the border. That is simply not the case and actually, that chart makes it look more arguable than it is. Because if you went to data before that, the levels of people coming across were many times higher than even in those early years, the 2006, 2007 level. So in terms of sheer quantity of human bodies crossing the border, there is no case to be made that we face any sort of crises. Um, Overall, the number of undocumented workers in the US has been declining steadily for a decade. You don't hear that talked about, but that is simply the case. And then a quick aside, even if there was a huge quantity of people coming across the border, that does not by itself constitute a crisis, especially considering, as we've talked about many times on this show, we've done myth busting before, our myths of American politics segments. Undocumented immigrants commit crimes at lower levels than native born American citizens. It's both property crimes and violent crimes. So to that extent, they're actually helping to lower the average level of crime on any individual here inside of the US. But 
Anyway, that first potential case for a crisis, sheer quantity of people, simply not the case. Don't expect to hear those numbers tonight though. So what if we're not worried about how many people are coming across the border? What if we're just worried about high risk individuals? So terrorists coming across the border, that has been the, the, the case that's been made recently. So Sarah Huckabee Sanders was talking on Fox News with, I think it was, it might have been Wallace that was talking with her. But in any event, she was saying that they had stopped something like 4,000 people that were terrorists or potential terrorists at the border. Now, even in real time on Fox News, that was shot down as a complete misstatement of numbers that are even in their broadest definition, only true about worldwide numbers for people being stopped, not at the border. And not terrorists, by the way, it's untrue in a lot of different ways. The vast, vast, vast majority of all of those people worldwide are attempting to enter the US through ships or mostly through planes, not walking across the southern border. So let's talk about the actual numbers of what she was trying to make you think the situation was, what's really going on? Well, there were 41 people on the terrorist screening database encountered at the southern border from October 1st, 2017 to March 31st, 2018, so you have there a little bit like around a half a year basically, so that's 41 people. 35 of them were US citizens or legal permanent residents, leaving only six non-US persons. And that does not mean six terrorists, that's people who have been flagged for one reason or another on this screening database. Now, there are people on that list that are terrorists or likely to be terrorists, that's certainly the case. But it is also possible to be on that list simply because you come from a country that has a lot of terrorists in it. So if you come from Syria during a particular year period, you will be put on that database regardless of whatever actions you have taken or not taken throughout your life. If you have traveled in a manner that is considered suspicious, so if you have flown through certain countries, you can be put on that list. Again, it does not mean that you are a terrorist. It just means they have some reason to be suspicious. But even with all of that said, during that period, there were six people. So now I know Fox News will say, well, one's enough. I mean, if you got one, you need a wall. If you've got one person, you need thousands of miles of steel or concrete at the border. But here's the thing, if this was actually a justification for the wall, then maybe it is, but not a justification for the wall between the US and Mexico. Because it turns out during that same period on the northern border, Customs and Border Protection stopped 91 people on the database, including 41 who were not American citizens or residents. So man, if six people justifies a wall between us and Mexico, 41 has gotta justify multiple walls. Good luck getting into Vancouver in the near future. Look, the truth of the matter is, regardless of whatever vague statistics, and I'm trying to be as fair as possible, but even there, this is vague information. The real situation, according to the AP, citing a Cato Institute study, the only known terrorists crossing the Mexico border from 1984 all the way to 2017 were three ethnic Albanians from Macedonia who came as children back in 1984 and were arrested in the foiled plot to attack the army base at Fort Dix in 2007. So even if I am being way more fair than anyone should be. And I assume that those ethnic Albanians came in as terrorist kids to later do this plot decades later, then there are three. They're not from Syria, okay, but they did cross the border. So that is true, we do have three over that time period. Now maybe that justifies a wall. To me personally, it does not. So those are two cases, sheer number of people, high risk targeted individuals, neither of those actually justify a wall. But what about the third argument? There's also drugs, they talk about the drug trade all the time. Um, but unfortunately, the DEA, DEA has talked about how drugs come into the country, not just the sheer quantity, but how they come in in the first place. So does the DEA think that a wall would actually help? Well, it turns out that only a small percentage of all the heroin seized by uh, CBP along the land border was between ports of entry. So that's being illegally brought in over the border, not through a port of entry. The majority of the inflow entering the US was at legal ports of entry followed by tractor trailers where the heroin is commingled with legal goods. So yeah, illegal drugs do come into the US. They're not just carted across the border by individuals in backpacks though. They're driven across in cars, in tractor trailers, all through ports of entry, which would still remain in their current status even if we had a wall. So if you had a wall, you would stop at best a very small fraction of the overall 
heroin trade coming into the US. And there are probably much better ways to do that. So if there's no need for a wall because of sheer quantity of people, if there's no need for a wall because of high risk individuals, if the drug trade would not be impacted by a wall, why shut down the government for it? Why declare a national emergency? Why do a national primetime address? Well, we know why, because his base wants a wall. Not that they need a wall, many of them don't live anywhere near the border. They don't know the situation of the border better than anyone else across the country. But they feel like they need it because they are scared as hell of the sorts of people they see in Fox News footage along the border. And so tonight, when he gives his address, don't expect facts about any of these situations. Expect a healthy, a healthy helping of fear mongering, disinformation, talking points from Stephen Miller, and little else. But hey, maybe I'll be surprised and maybe the media will do a great job of fact checking him. Anyway, that's all the time we have for our first block. When we come back, David Sirota is gonna be joining us. We're gonna be talking about taxation, the recent conversation nationwide about higher marginal tax rates and more after this. We need to talk about a relatively new show called Un the Republic or UNFTR. As a Young Turks fan, you already know that the government, the media and corporations are constantly peddling lies that serve the interests of the rich and powerful. But now there's a podcast dedicated to unraveling those lies, debunking the conventional wisdom. In each episode of Un the Republic, or UNFTR, the host delves into a different historical episode or topic that's generally misunderstood or purposely obfuscated by the so-called powers that be. Featuring in-depth research, razor-sharp commentary, and just the right amount of vulgarity, The UNFTR podcast takes a sledgehammer to what you thought you knew about some of the nation's most sacred historical cows. But don't just take my word for it. The New York Times described UNFTR as consistently compelling and educational, aiming to challenge conventional wisdom and upend the historical narratives that were taught in school. For as the great philosopher Yoda once put it, you must unlearn what you have learned. And that's true whether you're in Jedi training or you're uprooting and exposing all the propaganda and disinformation you've been fed over the course of your lifetime. So search for UNFDR in your podcast app today and get ready to get informed, angered, and entertained all at the same time. Joining us now to help break down some of the topics that have been dominating the headlines recently and will help to shape the 2020 Democratic primary, uh, David Sirota. David, welcome back to the show. Hey man, how you doing? It's great to have you here, I'm doing okay. I'd be happier if we didn't have this ridiculous address later on tonight, yeah. uh, but what can you do? Yeah. Uh, you know, why, don't, why don't we start with that? Um, so there's gonna be this prime time address by the, the president, uh, potentially declaring a national emergency over the border uh, to justify the government shutdown and possibly get billions of dollars for the wall. Uh, what, what do you think about this? Well, I mean, the question about whether to cover this, whether the broadcast network should cover it and air it uh, in its entirety. I mean, it's a question about whether there's actually gonna be news here. And and it's not necessarily clear that there's going to be a lot of news. Uh, and let's remember that the networks only a few years ago denied President Obama the same opportunity to talk on the same exact topic, immigration, uh, when he wanted to give a nationally televised uh, address. And, and I think what's interesting here is that that it sure seems like Trump is going to, uh, if he goes the national emergency route, he's he's going to create a potentially a, a, a bit of panic and, and a bit of, of hysteria, uh, politically driven hysteria. And let's remember that, that prior to this, when they rejected Obama speaking on this topic, Obama was going in the opposite direction. Obama was proposing a series of relatively technical, what he said were solutions. So in other words, the media is choosing to cover something that that could end up being a very overtly political spectacle, but didn't wasn't willing to offer the same amount of airtime to President Obama when he was doing something. And, and, and back then they said, we can't air it because it's too political. There's a contradiction yeah. there. Yeah, no, I'm glad that you pointed that out because uh, they said at the time he was it was gonna be too partisan. We can't cover that. Um, when what his plan was, he was going to talk about uh, work permits and formal protection from deportation to millions of undocumented immigrants, while focusing our enforcement resources on immigrants who'd committed violent crimes. Too political. A gigantic wall at the border. That's apolitical, though, I, I suppose. So, I, I do mean, you think that they should cover it? I mean, look. 
I tend to think that when a president is giving a speech and asking for airtime for a national address, assuming that the president hasn't asked for that every single time he wants to give any kind of speech, but on occasion, I think it's it's undeniably newsworthy. And I think the networks are right if they do go forward and give the Democrats a chance to to respond. And I hope that there's some decent fact checking of, of the president's speech. So it's hard for me to take issue with covering a, a president's speech in general. I think the question here though is, Clearly, there is not one standard by which they are deciding whether to offer this offer airtime for speeches like this. And that raises a question of what are the actual metrics by which these news organizations are deciding or, or deciding not to cover a president's speech. Yeah. So uh, there's another topic in the news that I really want to talk to you about. And that is uh, last week, uh, a preview for the 60 Minutes interview with uh, Representative Ocasio-Cortez. She floated the idea of higher marginal tax rates to pay for things like a Green New Deal, Medicare for All, uh, education, things like that. Um, and that has led to basically endless conversation about this topic. Uh, some of it honest, some of it I would say quite deceptive. Uh, overall, uh, what do you think of this conversation we're finally having as a country about possibly raising uh, marginal tax rates? Well, look, I think it's long overdue in the sense that the debate and the terms of the debate on taxes for the last 30 or 40 years have been uh, a terms of debate that, that are tilted towards uh, the only thing that's good are, is cutting taxes. That the only good tax policy is a tax policy that reduces taxes. Uh, and that we haven't had a historical, any historical context for that debate. And I think what, what uh, Ocasio-Cortez has done is remind us as an example, this debate has gone in a direction that has reminded people that, you know what, when the economy was doing much better for more people uh, back in the uh, middle 20th century and the and the uh, up until the 70s and early 80s, uh, the tax rates were far far higher, marginally speaking, on high income earners. And that basically what this has done is it's starting to very slowly demystify the idea that it's somehow outrageous to have a more progressive tax system with higher marginal tax rates on high income people. That in fact other countries, other industrialized countries with very uh, well and uh, well productive economies economies often have such higher marginal tax rates. And so, look, it's going to be a long battle to change that so-called Overton win window back to something uh, more rational and normal on taxes to bring that the terms of the debate back to, to, to a rational economic policy. But this certainly starts it. Yeah, and I think that we need to be willing to engage in that debate, not like willy nilly, but like reasonably with a plan to persuade people that it's necessary. Because we have to fight back against a lot of framing. I mean, the, the fact that we only talk about taxes as being a bad thing that we need to be relieved from is not an accident. That is a result of decades of work on from right wing think tanks and, and things like that. Um, but it is interesting that her doing this interview and, and very rarely do incoming representatives get 60 minute profiles so early on. That is, that is a mark of how successful she's been at helping drive the conversation. She brings up taxes, now Julian Castro is saying maybe as high as 90%. Others talking about it endlessly, the right wing defensive. It reminds me of when she did the protest outside of Speaker Pelosi's office, or you know, then she wasn't the speaker, and got everyone talking for literally weeks about a Green New Deal. It's pretty amazing. How her ability to help drive conversation far after she, you know, the, the interview that that spawned it. I, I totally agree, and I think look, there's a, that's a product of my, and to my mind, of two things. One, we now have more independent media. Uh, there's social media. Uh, political figures are able to speak directly to uh, voters, to an audience, uh, and that has, I think, uh, clearly had an effect on the political conversation. I also think that 2016, uh, the 2016 campaign and the Democratic primary in that campaign was a watershed moment where you had a kind of Democratic Party consensus census that was challenged through the candidacy of Bernie Sanders, but but with a lot of progressive voices behind him, challenging the fundamental, uh, uh, what's been called a centrist, uh, really corporate orthodoxy in the Democratic Party. And that that campaign began to create the space for the conversations that we're now having. In other words, that, that Ocasio-Cortez is using her independent media platform and her direct to voter platform to continue to and accelerate the conversation out of that sort of 
trapped orthodoxy where, for instance, taxes can't really be discussed in any serious way. Uh, investment uh, in, in green new jobs uh, can't be uh, discussed in any serious way. A jobs guarantee can't be discussed in any serious way. In other words, the monopoly on the, of the debate where we can't talk about things, that is over and that's a good thing. Yeah, yeah, and uh, it, it certainly won't happen without strike back from that center though, I've noticed over the past couple of weeks, uh, not only endless attacks against Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, including calling her a little girl and things like that, but Elizabeth Warren suddenly she's uh, unlikable again, and uh, Bernie Sanders has been attacked uh, from multiple fronts. He's not even a declared candidate yet, and he's already getting it. Um, should we buckle up for a 2019 that is just endless attacks and responses of this sort? Absolutely. Look, I, here's the deal. I mean, there are a lot of vested, powerful interests uh, in the status quo and in keeping the debate uh, anchored where the debate has been, where the political conversation has been for 30 or 40 years. Corporate forces in the Democratic Party and the Republican Party do not want to talk about higher marginal tax rates on the wealthy. They don't want to talk about uh, Medicare for all. They don't want to talk about tougher bank regulations because for those folks, Everything is good right now. The status quo is good for them. And they have a lot of money to try to push back. I mean, we've seen groups like Third Way, a, a group that gets a lot of funding from the financial sector, uh, attack Bernie Sanders by name over Medicare for all. I, yeah. I use that as an example of the corporate status quo is not going to allow for policy changes uh, all that easily. It is going to fight back. Yeah. Well, David, as always, thank you for joining us and, and talking the news with us. Thanks so much, man, I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, we're gonna take a break, when we come back, more on taxes and the right wing assault against this new conversation we're having as a country after this. <music> Just as we're finally rethinking our tax policy as a country, considering the possibility of raising marginal tax rates on the wealthiest Americans, the right is not simply going to sit down and take it, they're gonna fight back. They're just not gonna fight back in a way that I would identify as honest or reasonable. So first on the honest angle, Sean Hannity's not a fan of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, obviously. He often inadvertently pushes for her positions and he did that last night as well with a little gloss, a glaze of dishonesty on top. If we bring up this tweet from Representative Ocasio-Cortez, you're gonna see a screenshot from his show where he once again puts up some components of what he considers to be her platform. And I'm looking at that and I'm thinking, mm, again, that looks pretty good. Um, like who, even a conservative, if you look at that and say 100% free of fossil fuels by 2035, well, I mean, if we could do it, that sounds pretty good. Green New Deal, I'm hearing good things. Abolish ICE, maybe they find that to be controversial. I, I guess they're, they, they hate the idea of canceling Puerto Rico's Wall Street debt because it's Puerto Rico, I suppose. Um, the thing is, of course, there's dishonesty. So she is not proposing, no one is proposing a 70% federal tax rate. That's that's even more dishonest than the normal way that her proposal has been covered. And well, let's bring that back up because you're gonna see she corrupts, corrects him, thankfully. It's a 70% marginal tax rate on multi-million dollar income. So not a federal tax rate of 70% even on millionaires, let alone on everyone. That is what is so I would say insultingly dishonest about this. So I would like to say again what I've said several times now, to give an idea of how few people would be affected by the current proposal that she made if informally, it is not a tax on the 10%, it's not a tax on the 1%. It doesn't even affect all of the 1%, it's a tax on depending on how you calculate it, slightly less than half of 1% or as little as one tenth of 1%. And so I think that I can say reasonably and accurately that you have never met anyone who would be affected by this higher marginal tax rate. Uh, maybe you're an exception, maybe you hang out with Tom Hanks, I don't know, maybe Will Smith, I don't know. But that's a very high bar in terms of income. I don't believe I've ever met anyone that makes that much money. Now, that is not to say that if you haven't met those people that their, their needs or their concerns or their rights don't matter. But it's to give people an idea of how willfully Fox News is lying when they say, your taxes will go up or taxes will go up. No, not taxes will go up. Maybe on a mansion in Pasadena, Malibu, I don't know, something like that. There are some people that would be affected by it, certainly. But not the average person, certainly not the average Fox News viewer. They are willfully lying about that at that point. But it's not just dishonesty, 
some of the arguments from the right wing on why we shouldn't raise taxes on the wealthy are just ridiculous once you think about them for even a second. And that was exemplified by Fox and Friends. So take a look at their coverage of the proposal. Taxed at 90%, why bother? Uh, did, he, did the gentleman refer to a fair share? Yes. A fair share is 90% for the government and maybe 10% kept by you? That hardly seems fair to me. Looks to, two points, looks to me like number one, the far left is now calling the shots for the entire Democrat party as you roll up towards 2020. At least so, two, two of the bigger names. Uh, okay, okay. Well, what's the sense of working but they're hard making, then? They're making all of the headlines, they're making all of the running, and Nancy Pelosi constantly has to talk about whether she's gonna go with this or with that. The far left is making the running, and that's very dangerous for America. What does that mean for our our economy because well, what's the point. incentive of working hard and don't the people who contribute that much to society and are creating the big businesses, yes. aren't they helping our economy? Okay, so there they're responding to a, a, a brief comment by Julian Castro, who is not proposing a 90% tax rate, let alone a 90% tax rate. It was a marginal tax rate on the, the wealthiest, um, not AOC. It's higher than what she was saying, but regardless, we'll talk about it anyway. So again, they're being dishonest. They're saying it is a tax. Why should you work? If they're just gonna take away all of your money. Well, of course, virtually no one watching Fox and Friends that day makes $10 million a year. It's probably a couple of businessmen, maybe. Maybe the president pulls in $10 million a year or something like that. And certainly he watches Fox News. But it is deceitful, deceitful to the extreme to imply that that would ever affect the regular person watching Fox News. But even if it did, it's ridiculous for all sorts of other reasons. The idea that the rich would not work hard if they were taxed at 60, 70, or even 90% is not just ridiculous hypothetically, it is disproven by American history. Because as we pointed out many times, the tax rate was over 90% on the wealthiest individuals for a period. It was 94%. For a brief period, for a longer period, it was 70, 80% somewhere around there, higher than what Alexandria Ocasio Cortez was pushing for. But it existed for literally decades. And not only did the rich work, not only did they show up, but they produced economic worth value for the country and for themselves, the likes of which America and indeed the country, the world had never seen in world history. So we don't need to hypothesize about whether Bezos would still show up in the morning if his marginal tax rates were higher. We already know that that did happen. And I will speak a little bit more generally because I've never been extremely wealthy. I'll probably never be extremely wealthy. So perhaps I'm speaking out of ignorance here. But when they say, why would you work if you could only keep 30% or 40% of what you make above $10 million? As if that is the only thing that motivates people to work, is that they will take in the money. And I think what they mean, to be fair, is not the taking in of the money, but the ability to spend the money. Because having money does nothing for you, it's the using the money that's actually good. That doesn't make any sense right now. Let's look at the Koch brothers, for instance. They are fabulously wealthy, they're billionaires. Are they going to work to earn more money? Could they reasonably spend every, every dollar they have already, even if they were taxed at 100%, if they in a Brewster's billions sorts of situation decided until the day they die, they're just gonna spend every dollar they can, would they be able to go through the money they have right now? And they're far more economically sound mentally than I am, I'm sure, they certainly have better training. They know that, they know that they can't spend the money they have now, let alone any extra money that they'll make in the future. So it is ridiculous to say that the only thing that drives the wealthiest people in the history of our species is bringing in more money, let alone all of the other arguments against it. But this is a preview of what Fox News and the right wing is going to use to cloud the issue and to convince people to once again, as we always do, vote against our own economic interests. They wanna convince you that the tax will affect you, which it will not. And that it will destroy economic output, which it will not, and which it did not when we had higher taxes than anything that's being proposed right now. But will that actually work? I don't know. I don't know. The right wing can be persuasive. It's very easy. That the rest of the media often just goes along with right wing narratives. But I can say that polling data implies that if the right wing intends to make 2020 an argument to protect the wealthy from additional taxes, it doesn't look good for them right now. An April 2018 Gallup survey had 62% of respondents saying the wealthy do not pay their fair share in taxes, a number that's been consistently in the high 50s or low 60s for the last 18 years or so. 
Pew found the year before that 60% of the public said it bothered them a lot. That the fact that rich people don't pay their fair share. Again, the same terminology that AOC and Julian Castro are using when talking about this. And a 2017 CBS poll found that 56% of voters said wealthy people should pay higher taxes. That is so obviously the case that the public is frustrated about the fact that the rich pay far less in taxes than they did earlier. That did you know that regularly during the 2016 election, Donald Trump pushed for higher taxes on the wealthy, even going so far as to say, even myself. He repeatedly said that especially in the financial sector, but otherwise he said, I've heard from rich friends of mine and say, you, we could afford to pay a little bit more and that's something I'm thinking about, maybe we should raise it. Over and over and over again, back during the campaign, he raised that possibility. It's been gone obviously since he became president. And once he became president, they slashed the taxes on the rich. But even he knew that if you're trying to get people to vote for you, you better talk about raising taxes on the wealthy. Now that is gonna be a part of the 2020 election. We will see if the feeble defenses of the right wing are able to stop it. Okay, we're gonna take a short break, we come back more for you. If you're hearing my voice right now or seeing my image, it's probably because you're either watching this on a streaming service or listening to it as a podcast. Both of those things only possible because of gigantic internet corporations that have developed the websites and the technology to make it so. But how did we actually get to this point where if you have relatively reliable video and audio on the internet? Joining us now is someone who has quite a bit to say about that. So Matthew Carnahan, welcome to the show, showrunner for Valley of the Boom. Premiering this Sunday, I want to get the time right, it's 9 p.m. Central, correct, on National Geographic? I think that's correct, yeah. So your show is about the the early days of the rise of gigantic internet corporations, correct? Yeah, it's about, I, I it's it's more about the, the, the moment when these amazing makers showed up and, and uh, brought us the browser, you know, mm-hmm. Mark Andreessen, who invented the Mosaic browser, and then the commercial version of that, which was uh, Netscape Navigator, mm-hmm. which has basically changed the way every one of us live our lives every minute of every day. Yeah, uh, some since. like me more than others. Yeah, but, exactly, but yeah. exactly, <laughs> and our paychecks. Yeah, um, yeah. So. Um, it's it's really about this this moment when these amazing people, you know, uh, Andreessen and and uh, and uh, Netscape, um, uh, this this company called the Globe.com, which was a, uh, a social networking company, mm-hmm. sort of Facebook ten years before Facebook, um, and uh, the advent of streaming. Mm-hmm. Um, which was a little dubious. The the, the guy who was uh, involved in streaming, named Michael Fain, um, which was actually turned out not to be his name. A bit of a con man, <laughs> it turns uh, absolute out. Absolute con man. Yeah. But you know, some of our greatest uh, you know pioneers of uh, you know the the P. T. Barnums of the world. You know. Yeah. Um, so and what's I, what I find interesting is that there are parallels there to some of the big names and big corporations that we talk about in terms of the internet. Every day now, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. So we have a, a trailer for the show. Why yes. don't we give people yeah. a look at that, and then we'll Great. come back for more. A and then the ring around it. At what, what do you is say internet that, Allison? anyway? Here's Allison, can you explain what internet is? One word: Netscape. Netscape. They have zero concept of what Netscape is. Pixelon is number one in internet broadcasting. Theglobe.com. It's a social network. People will want to log on. I guarantee. Why don't we have a price? Refresh your page. Seventy-one dollars a share. It's the biggest IPO since Microsoft. Congratulations. Congratulations. It also makes us a target. This is the beginning of what they call the browser wars. I'm going to bring in a couple of experts. Netscape changed the game. We were at Microsoft's mercy. They were deathbed competitors. We are running a billion dollar company. We've also got Microsoft bringing back their back. Prepare to boldly go where no man has gone before. Valley of the Boom, Sunday, January 13th at 9 on National Geographic. So it looks like there's going to be a little bit of drama. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a dramatic moment, you mm-hmm. know. That the the internet boom and subsequent bust were uh, were some dramatic moments in Silicon yeah. Valley for sure. You um, know, it's interesting that 
like that we know some big names like you most people probably know who Zuckerberg is and, mm -hmm. and a few others but these earlier big names that that laid the foundation for some of the the tools we use now like most people probably don't even remember Netscape I mean I remember it vaguely me too vaguely. Um, from early on I remember using the internet before there were really search engines mm -hmm. like they were in their earliest infancy um, but a lot of this this history it's like disappeared people just don't know about it yeah I, I think more than any other world that I've you know tiptoed into, um, Silicon Valley does not look back. They don't even look at the present so much. <laughs> I mean, the present is kind of this thing that's happening while they're busy looking into the future. Yeah. You know? So, you know, I, what I found is that people who are engineers and coders and founders and CEOs, they don't know about Netscape really. Mm -hmm. They don't know the Netscape story. They certainly don't know about the globe, you know, which, you know, which presaged Facebook and MySpace and all of that. Um, yeah. And, you know, it's amazing. It's amazing because there's a lot to learn from, you know, the fact that none of those companies are. Exist around today. Yeah, and some you know? didn't last long. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, th they're going to learn that, and they're going to learn that in a pretty unique way. So yeah. th the trailer makes it appear like it's, you know, a show, a drama, a scripted drama. Right. Um, but it's not just a scripted drama, it's more of a no. hybrid. So it's can you describe definitely that? Definitely a strange. Um, you know, when I when I went to National Geographic and, and kind of pitched it to them, I said, um, I, I don't, I want to make this as try to make this as disruptive as the makers who were making these companies were at the time. You know, they were blowing up, you know, uh, they were blowing up Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. And, you know, let's blow up the National Geographic brand and let's just totally ruin it. Yeah. And to my surprise, <laughs> they were they were really excited about that. Yeah. Well, so, I, I hope you didn't use the term ruin it when you said it. To them. I did. Oh, I did. Really? And, okay. they, and they just kind of <laughs> laughed. And I, maybe they assumed I was kidding. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, I really tried to just, you know, at every turn, rather than explaining something you know, like the browser war, it's a very dry notion. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, the fact is, you know, Bill Gates was a total OG. You know, mm -hmm. he came in <laughs> and he just, you know, laid waste to Netscape and went after them in the most gangster way. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you know, so we were like, okay, well, we need a rap battle, you know, to, to, to show. <laughs> obviously. Yeah, obviously, duh. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so, so uh, that, that was, it's just been really fun to just kind of at every turn, you know what's a what's a what's a what's the a historic um, IPO like? It's like you need a flash mob. You know, mm -hmm. you need a giant musical number. You know, because puppets these, maybe. <laughs> we did. Uh, we do have a Bill Gates puppet who's now sitting in my <laughs> living room, looking really <laughs> horribly defiled. Um, uh, but. <laughs> But, I, I have no follow up on the I mean, filing. He's not. I just but, said he looked. Looked. Yeah. Not I was going to ask if he appears in the show. I, I guess does. in some context. He does. He absolutely does, and he's amazing. Yeah. Um, so I, I am. I'm interested uh, to know. Like we, this history is mostly opaque, and and even at the time, I think like most people didn't even understand the internet at the time. They they probably didn't know too much about the. the well, you look there. at you look at that clip. You know, of, explain of, the internet. You know, well, I remember, really smart people. Exactly. Who Having didn't know. no idea what at and you know about and exactly. Yeah. When I was in sixth grade, I remember uh, teachers coming to me and saying, "Hey, you use the internet, right? We have guests coming. Can you show them websites?" <laughs> and as I said, there wasn't really search engines, so yeah. I, I think I showed them SciFi.com for the uh -huh. TV channel because uh -huh. that was like you went to direct websites, not like you know right. links and everything. Um, but anyway, yeah. So now there's. There's Zuckerberg, and there are these big brands, and I wonder if because we know more about the individuals, especially Zuckerberg, and we're a little bit more savvy about our privacy. I wonder if some of the mystique and the reverence of these big figures that help to shape our lives. I wonder if some of that is wearing off, and if that might be oh, a permanent thing. It's at least wearing off. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think I think you know if you kind of describe. The trajectory of the Internet age, as you know, this this period that we're describing in in my show is kind of Internet 1.0. Mm -hmm. um, we are, I would say, now in the twilight of Internet 2.0. Mm -hmm. 
Um, because I think Internet 2.0 has been about, hey, here's my personal information. Uh, here, yeah. it's so amazing that, that I can share my photos, and here's my political affiliation, and here's my, here's everything you need to screw me over. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think that now, the, I think that, that even the most casual, devoted you know, Facebook user is kind of scratching their head now and going, oh, I, I feel a little, I feel, I feel Maybe a bit ouchy in my, you know, in my private places. Yeah. And, you know, like, <laughs> um, they feel, you know, they feel betrayed. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, and I don't think it's any accident that we're now kind of sliding into a crypto technology mm -hmm. age and that that is going to, that we're really shifting into a, an age where we're once again looking at our privacy as a as a valuable asset. Yeah, yeah. So interesting. Well, yeah. I mean, we certainly it seemed to be at a turning point. It'll be interesting to see what direction yeah. we turn in. Yeah, yeah. Thank well, you. I wish we had more time to talk, uh, but yeah. the show is coming in just a few days. Yes, I mean, it, January is. yes it is. January thirteenth. Yeah. This Sunday on National Geographic, mm -hmm. at nine p.m. Uh, Matthew, thank you for joining us. Oh, it was a pleasure. Thank Great you. to have you on. Thanks. We're gonna take uh, one more break. We come back, news from around the world. It's time to take a look at what's going on around the world in a segment we call Meanwhile In. Meanwhile in Rio, a man attacked a woman and quickly wished that he had not. The issue was that the target was a straw weight UFC fighter who turned the tables on the thief with punches, a kick, and a rear naked choke before forcing him to sit and wait for the police. I've seen pictures of him, he looks pretty roughed up. And you can take a look, let's bring up this picture, you're gonna see the man's weapon, quickly wishing that he had something more durable. Now, as in all of these cases, I want to give credit to the woman for defending herself, but obviously should have never been put in the position to have to do that. Of course, let's just put that out there. But this shows that a little bit of you know self defense certainly can help out if the worst happens. But while that's going on, meanwhile, in meanwhile in Cuba, a mystery has been solved, and this is fascinating. Do you remember this from not too long ago? Uh, November 2016, American diplomats in Cuba complained of persistent high pitched sounds followed by a range of symptoms, including headaches, nausea, and hearing loss. There, like if you don't recall, there were lots of reports about this of people being sickened relatively quickly, and theories started to crop up that this might indicate the deployment of some sort of sonic weaponry. And it spread so much that I heard of similar cases happening at embassies in China as well. And the thought was, oh my God, these people are sitting ducks and they're being sonically attacked. Sonic weapons might exist, but it turns out that's not what was going on in Cuba. On Friday, two scientists presented evidence that those sounds were not so mysterious after all, they were made by crickets. <laughs> Or so the sonic weaponeers want you to believe. Okay, so here's the thing. If they were made by crickets, why did they have nausea? It is possible that this is one of those cases where something being out in the news leads people to think that that is an explanation for their symptoms. So a person feels a headache, a person feels nausea, they hear crickets and think, oh, that is probably responsible. Well, causality is complicated. We need to look at it from multiple directions. Again, it's not impossible that sonic weapons could exist, but it turns out perhaps not in Cuba as we so feared. Meanwhile, tragedy in another country. So this is a dark one, unfortunately. In Poland, an escape room trip ended in tragedy. A fire broke out in a squat two-story concrete building in northwestern Poland. Five 15-year-old girls died in that accident, trapped in a tiny windowless room, no bigger than a closet, with no emergency exit and no key. So at best, this was a poorly designed unsafe escape room, if not some sort of like quick, cheap knockoff of an escape room that cost five girls 
their lives, which is obviously the exact opposite of what anyone would hope out of any sort of situation like this. Um, it is leading to reform in this industry in the country, a preliminary investigation revealed that the house failed to meet even the most basic safety precautions. There are hundreds of rooms like this in Poland, thousands across the region. And Poland says that they are going to inspect literally all of them. By yesterday, actually, they were due to have inspected 325. And they found 1100 violations, 400 of them related to issues with emergency exits. And I will say this, as a person who has been to many of these, the emergency exit part of an escape room, pretty important for safety reasons. Poland should look into it, other countries should as well. Hopefully we can learn from this. Anyway, that's all we have for today. Thank you for watching, we'll see you tomorrow morning. Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad free, access members only bonus content and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola, I'll see you soon.